Good morning, church. Anybody notice anything strange up on the stage? Anybody, anybody pick it out? Dueling electric guitars? And Jason, show him your shirt here. I got it. We got to do this. Everybody look, look close. He's got, he, you know how excited he is about this series. When he goes and has a shirt printed just for this sermon, because that's, that's how I'm taking it right there. I am so fired up, and I've heard a great buzz, and a lot of you are really excited about this new series. We're going to be looking, just a heads up, at some of the stranger, more lesser known, if you can say more or lesser in the same sentence, some of the more bizarre and unique stories, stories that maybe you've never heard, or stories that maybe you've heard and you went, huh, well, that's strange, and you just keep going. Because that's what I noticed when I was looking into this. I started doing my research on this. I've been thinking about it for a while. But I said, you know what? Every good doctorate, seminary level theologian must go to the source to find what is strange. I'm not talking about the Bible. I'm talking about Google, of course. When you go to the internet and you Google it, I say, well, I wonder what would happen if you just enter strange things or bizarre or unexplainable things. By the way, I do not recommend doing that. Just, just hear me say that from the beginning. But I found my top five favorite things that came up that were kind of humorous to me of some truly unexplainable things. Like this first one here. There is truly something going on here that is beyond <laughs> explanation. Um, sir, you're doing it wrong. Let, let me just tell you, I believe, I'm not a fisherman. I believe the boat goes in first and then the truck can kind of come in. But again, that's just me. Maybe, that, maybe you're different with that. Then I saw this other explainable thing, which is a classic. It comes up all the time. What is going on? Here we have somebody getting arrested or something's going on over here. A truck is in the raging river, and then we have this man who is way too happy holding a sewing machine like he's going to prom. This picture cannot be explained. It was very awkward, which brought up the next thing that came up in my search. I love this one. Well, this is awkward. How many have cats, by the way? Show of hands. How many have dogs? Okay, this is evenly split. Well, this might be offensive. I'm not sure, but we're going to... You know how you come home and your dog greets you at the door and they're so excited? Or you come home, maybe your cat does. Maybe you have three or four black cats that, that greet you because there's nothing more awkward than that moment when you realize you don't have any cats. <laughs> Yet there they are, which brings me to... My last and most favorite one, I love this one here. A cop just knocked on my door and told me my dogs were chasing people on bikes. To which, of course, I said, that's impossible because my dogs don't even own bikes. There's no way they're riding bikes and chasing these people. This set us up on a perfect, perfect uh, launch for this series because I want to ask us a question. What do you do when you're reading your Bible and you stumble upon something that is downright bizarre? Maybe something that's creepy or maybe strange or obscure or just, just seems out of place. Because most of the time we're reading through the scriptures, we're having our quiet times, and we read these passages, and we just kind of gloss over them, right? We think, huh, well, that's weird. And then we just keep going, like pretending we didn't see it. Like, well, that was strange. I can't explain it. I hope nobody asked me about that. We're just going to keep going. Pre pretend what you just read isn't weird and proceed, right? Like Leslie Nielsen, every time he says, there's nothing to worry about here, nothing, just, just keep moving on. Because you're thinking, are you sure? Because it looks like there's a whole lot going on behind him. The world's exploding. And that's how I feel when we get to these scripture passages. Like, it may be the most bizarre thing. And you're thinking, what would a lost person, how would I respond if they came up and said, well, what about this bizarre passage? That's why it's important that we know what's going on. When we look at this, sometimes when we come across something strange, our natural tendency is to just keep reading. And guess what? Sometimes that's okay. Here's why. Scripture is so different than any other book. Sometimes it is actually self-illuminating. In other words, it, it reveals itself. If you just keep reading, nine times out of ten, Scripture will come back and will clarify what's going on. The, the context is what's key here. You know what I'm talking about? When you're reading a passage, give it a chance for God to speak to you through that. Seek no other meaning let it have a meaning and a chance to, to say what it says right there because it's probably revealed on later. But every once in a while, let's just be honest, you come across a passage like this one today that is so bizarre, it cries out for more knowledge. It cries out for deeper study. And that is exactly how you find yourself in a series like this today. So I want to set the context of what we're going to read. We're going to read a lot of Scripture today. 
I want you to find these, but don't read them. Don't put them up yet, Ryan. Find Matthew 27 and Luke 24, okay? Pull up your favorite Bible app. I'm going to read from the NLT a lot today. And while you pull up Matthew 27, let me welcome our online campus. Great to have you with us each and every week if you can't be here live. And if you're a first-time guest, we want to give you a special welcome, too. Thank you for checking us out. I hope God's Word will speak to you today loud and clear. So Matthew 27 first, and then we'll get to Luke 24 in just a minute. I want to set the context for what we're looking at. Obviously, last week was Easter, so we looked at the resurrection, naturally, and it was powerful, and it was awesome. We looked at four great comebacks that you're guaranteed because of the resurrection. Today, we have the luxury of time to go deeper into some strange things that happened during the resurrection that we couldn't get to last week, some truly bizarre things that we may have read, but we just didn't quite click what was going on here, some things that happened just before the crucifixion, and some things that happened right after the crucifixion, some truly strange things. So here's what's happening as we join this story in progress. It's the day of the crucifixion. Jesus is on the cross in this moment, and he is, he is getting ready to cry out several key statements. We won't dive into all of them. We're just going to look at, at a couple of them. But it's the day of the crucifixion, and already some very strange and supernatural things are beginning to happen. In fact, we read that a frightening and a very unnatural darkness descends over the land. And it's not just for a couple minutes like an eclipse. We read that this lasts for three solid hours, from noon until three. A very unsettling and an unnatural darkness descends over the land, and the ground begins to rumble. The earth starts shaking, and the Lord now has called out from the cross a few times, but now it is all building to these final dramatic moments, and that's where we follow along. Look at verse 50. Then Jesus shouted again, and he released his spirit. At that moment, the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split apart, the tombs opened, and many bodies of godly men and women who had died were raised from the dead. They left the cemetery after Jesus' resurrection, went into the holy city of Jerusalem, and appeared to many. Read that last verse again. What is that about? And why don't we hear more about this strange event? We're talking people coming from the dead, people who have been known to have died. They come out of their graves. They were dead. Remember, guys, they had funerals for these people. These were family members. These were loved ones. These were friends. These were people who were known to have been dead. And think about this. Can you imagine the reaction of friends and family members when reports start trickling in from the outskirts of town that there are people who have been known to have died who are being spotted walking the streets. Creepy. I mean, ha have you thought about this? Think about this. We know what happened to Jesus. We get that. He has a resurrection. But what do you do? Put yourself in that moment. This is so, how would you react if someone called and said, hey, you remember Uncle Bob? Yeah? I just saw him at Walmart. What are you talking about? He died in 84. He's at Walmart. He's buying Fido some food. This is unbelievable. I'm like, you can't, there's no way. This is so strange. In fact, to think of these people coming back and walking among us, I almost called this message a different title because it was so appropriate. But then I said, you know, we're only going to be on this passage. So I went back to the original title because I picture the walking dead when I hear this. This bizarre, strange verse that says they left the cemetery and they started coming. Let me ask you a bizarre question, okay? Maybe it's just me that thinks this way, but of all these people who came out of their graves and left the cemetery, what happened to them? We know what happened to Jesus. We know his story. We know he was resurrected, had a glorified body, and he went. And, and, and you know, What happened to these guys? Did they hang around? Were they walking the street? Could you tell they were dead? Could you tell they were previous? Were they undead now? What do you call these people? Did they, <laughs> did they have the zombie-like look when they were sitting there walking around? Were they, were they thinking, you know, oh, that's, you can tell that's, that's Jim Bob because he's kind of gray now and he's washed out, you know? Did he, did he have tufts of hair that was missing or one eye that just goes this way or something? You, what, could you tell? Seriously, you got to think about this. These people came back from the dead. 
They were buried. Some were in tombs. Some were in the ground. And yet they've come out of the grave like walking dead. And Scripture doesn't say specifically what happened to them. All we know is we're faced with two questions. What happened to these people? Were they alive again just as mere humans like you and I? Or did they have resurrected bodies? Because if they were alive again just as you and I, let me ask the obvious question. Did they die again? And if so, what about these poor families? Are they going to have to have another funeral? It almost sounds like a bad comedy. We're thinking, bless that family's heart. They just finished paying for that first funeral. And now they got to go do it again. I mean, do you see how strange and how out of characteristic this passage is when you, when you study it? And as I look at this, I'm, 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 I'm wondering why is Matthew the only gospel that records this strange miracle? This is the only information we have about this moment. And he doesn't say specifically what happened to them. If they were brought back to life, if they continued to live normal, or they were resurrected with glorified bodies. So you know me, I did some digging for us. And I did some research, and I found what a lot of great thinkers, people I respect, people like John MacArthur and I think David Jeremiah, they say that since they are never mentioned again, that since they showed up and, and they kind of vanish after this, that it's likely they were given glorified bodies, similar to what Jesus had, and then ascended. But here's the deal. They obviously had to remain around the earth long enough to establish this miracle, to say he is risen and then ascend to glory, because we know about this. So obviously they were seen just long enough. We don't know because Scripture never specifically tells us what happened. It is a mystery for sure and the perfect launch for our series. Now, if you've been with me for a few years and you came on a Wednesday night, maybe two years ago, I got to dive into what happens next when we were going through O.S. Hawkins' book, The Jesus Code. And we looked at a specific passage of Scripture. Today, we're going to go so deep into this. It is so strange what happens just after the resurrection. So let me set the scene before we go to Luke 24. Three years now, Christ's disciples had been walking with him. They have been talking with Jesus. They have been learning from him. They have been eating with him. They've been sharing a home with him and sleeping and, and, and always with him. And then suddenly, boom, everything comes to a crashing halt. Everything stops. The Lord that they love, the one who was coming to redeem Israel, is gone. He's lying in a tomb. And they are devastated. And they, all the hope that they held on to was now sitting buried in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. There's no doubt they're confused probably dismayed, maybe even a little dejected at this point, and they were walking proof that there is no power for us in the present if we have no hope for the future. Hope fuels our life. We talked about that last week. The resurrection is what fuels our hope. This is such a powerful thing. So we see two disciples that are on a road. Some of the disciples after the crucifixion kind of went into hiding. They didn't behave like we thought they would. Some of them are cowering behind locked doors. Others are disbanding and going back to their hometowns, I guess, to resume life as they've always known it before. It is a very tenuous time in Christianity. Everything hangs by a thread. And that's where we pick up the story we're going to read. Look at Luke 24, verse 13. That same day, okay, this is the day of the resurrection. Two of Jesus' followers were walking to the village of Emmaus, seven miles from Jerusalem. As they walked along, they were talking about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things, Jesus himself suddenly came and began walking with them. But God kept them from recognizing him. Okay, all right, so pause there. Look at this. They don't know this is Jesus. They just know there is a man who appeared behind them. The Greek indicates he showed up and he began to quicken his pace after listening for a little bit. He quickened his pace and he caught up with them, okay? That's how the original language reads here. But they don't know this is Jesus. We do. Erase that, okay? Put yourself in their shoes. They just know there's a dude walking beside them who was trailing them for a little bit, and here he is, okay? So put this in context. God kept them from recognizing. Verse 17, he says, hey, what are you discussing so intently about as you walk along? And this stopped them. They stopped short with sadness written across their face. Then one of them, Cleopas, replied, you must be the only person in Jerusalem who hasn't heard about all the things that have happened here these last few days. I love Jesus. He's so good. Huh? What things? As if he doesn't know. This is beautiful. He wants to hear this. What things? Jesus asked. The things that happened to Jesus, the man from that, they're talking to him. 
Think, think about it. Picture this. The things that happened to Jesus, the man from Nazareth. He was a prophet who did powerful miracles, and he was a mighty teacher in the eyes of God and all the people. But our leading priests and other religious leaders handed him over to be condemned to death, and they crucified. You can hear the pain in their voice. We had hoped he was the Messiah, the one who had come to rescue Israel. And this all happened three days ago. Then some women from our group of his followers were at the tomb early this morning. They came back with an amazing report. They said his body is missing and that they had seen angels who told them Jesus is alive. Some of our men ran out to see, and sure enough, his body was gone, just as the women had said. Now, we've got to pause here because there's something happening right here. Anybody notice anything strange? These are two of his, these aren't the inner core 12 disciples. These are some of his followers closer, probably the 70 that he sent out. These are probably two of those. Notice the lack of full-hearted embrace that Jesus is who he says he is and was who he says he was. Notice they say things like, oh, there was this amazing report, and they came back, and they said his body was missing. And like, uh, that, that was really strange. And, and some of our men were out, and yep, sure enough, they didn't say he was ar- risen from the dead. It says, his body was gone. Like, w- w- this is strange. Earlier, did you catch the description? When they were talking to Jesus, he was, he was a prophet. Uh, he had great teachings. He did miracles. Never once did they say he was the son of God. Even then, they didn't quite grasp everything about him. Now, it's easy for us to go, you're so foolish. How did you miss it? Because we see everything clearly looking back in hindsight. They didn't have that. But do you see how close they are to the truth, yet they missed it? They're walking with Jesus. Okay? So I wanted to pause to say, Set up what happens next. It's almost as if this next line, Jesus says, enough already. Follow what he says next. Then Jesus says, you foolish people. (laughs) You find it so hard to believe all that the prophets wrote in the scriptures. Wasn't it clearly predicted the Messiah would have to suffer all these things before he went to glory? Then Jesus took them. Remember, they still don't know who he is yet. Then Jesus took them through the writings of Moses all the way through the prophets, explaining all the scriptures, the things concerning who? Himself. He's talking about himself. By this time, they had walked so far, they were nearing Emmaus, the end of their journey. And Jesus acted as if he was going to keep going. But they begged him, stay the night with us. It's already getting late. So he does. He goes in with them. And as they sat down to eat, he took the bread and he blessed it. Oh, get ready. It's about to get freaky. Then he broke it and he gave it to them. Suddenly, their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. And in that moment, boom, he vanishes. He disappears. What? Notice their reaction. They look at each other. Didn't our hearts burn within us? As he talked on the road, it's dawning on them. They could just see the wheels turning. They explained the scriptures to us. And within the hour, they said, well, that was cool. Can you pass me some more bread? No. No. Within the hour, they go back to Jerusalem. They had just walked seven miles to get there. And it didn't say later, like, oh, we've got to talk about it. There's a big uh, Make Emmaus Great Again rally we want to go to. They got up, and they went back in the dark through the twisted roads and showed up back in Jerusalem. Why? What happened in this strange, bizarre, there's so much going on in here. Think about this. They're at dinner. Their eyes were suddenly opened, and he vanishes from their sight. Scripture doesn't say he opened a door. It doesn't say he climbed out through a window and distracted them with some breadcrumbs over there while he disappeared. It wasn't hocus pocus razzmatazz. He literally vanishes right in front of their eyes, right after, strangely enough, he breaks bread. One of the last things they also saw him do in the upper room. There is so much to unpack. And then I love their response. Did not our hearts burn within us? while he talked with us on the road, while he opened the scriptures to us. And there it is. Holy heartburn. Holy heartburn. This is incredible. Church, we chase after so many things in life. There are so many things, so many shiny trinkets and baubles and bangles and distractions, all these things that just get us off of what truly matters when what we really need are burning hearts for him. That is the mark of a mature Christian. And there it is. So how do we acquire this this heavenly heartburn? And what does that feel like? I got to thinking about that. And I tried to remember when I first had heartburn for another person. Y'all remember 
when you first laid eyes on the one you love, the one you fell in love with. Because I can remember it. In fact, I, have a, I, have, I know exactly where we were the very minute it was on that platform, Shades Mountain Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama. God bless America. Roll Tide. And as we were walking in, I was on staff, and I came walking in, and Amy was right here sitting in a chair with three other people rehearsing a drama for later that morning. It was a, I can't even tell you the dress she was wearing. It was blue with flowers. I can't even tell you the brand name. It was made by Rampage, right? True story? How, how strange is this? I'm a guy. I can't even tell you what I'm wearing. And, and I, 20-something years ago, I can remember what she was wearing, and I saw her, and I went, who is that? I would like to have Bible study with her because my motives were very pure, right? <laughs> Just true, true story. That's what you felt, I'm sure, when you saw your spouse. It's very pure. And I said, Maya, I would like to pray with her. And so people started to introduce us. And we met each other. And we were in the middle of rehearsing these late, late Christmas musical things. And we would go till 10, 11, sometimes midnight, rehearsing 70-piece orchestra, huge set, and all these things. We connected so quickly, we didn't want to leave each other's presence. So what we would do, rather than go home, we went to the parking lot. I'd walk her to her car, but we wouldn't get, we wouldn't go. We'd sit down, we'd start talking, it's freezing cold, it's December, and like, uh. so we'd get in the car, we'd turn up, turn the engine on, get some heat going, and we're like, what are we doing? We're poor college people, we can't afford this, turn the car off. So we'd be freezing again in a few minutes, but we would just keep talking. Then it'd be one in the morning, then two in the morning, and then three in the morning, and we're like, I don't want to go home, I just want, are you, I'm not tired, are you tired? Just, what? I'm good. You know what we would do? A wise person would start the car, and you would go to your respective homes, not us. We said, how can we make this last longer? I know. Let's get outside in the freezing cold and throw the football. True story. I have a picture of this. In short sleeves, we would throw the football in the parking lot of the church because we didn't want to leave each other's presence so that we could stay awake a little longer to go inside the car and talk. And that's all we did, I promise. We just talked. That was it. I, I promise you. We, we were not even a couple at this point. We were just getting to know each other. A little bit later... I invited her to my senior recital, and that is when I knew she was probably going to be the one for me. Oh, look at that. I just want to stare at her. Let's just have an awkward moment and stare at my wife. <laughs> is that good for everybody? Awkward? Isn't that nice? So we go back a couple years ago, and I say, I want to take her. I'm going to surprise her. We went back to that same spot where we first met, and I have a picture of this sacred moment where my heart burned for the first time, and I knew she was the one. And we have this beautiful picture, and here we are seated, and then Milo had to photobomb it. <laughs> you look behind her, because that's what Milo does. And that's what I think of when I picture a burning heart. Did my heart not burn? I didn't want to leave her presence. Those two, when they realized who it was, and even before they did, they were walking on the road, did their hearts not burn within them? They have, have you had that holy heartburn? And if not, have you ever? Or when was the last time that you were so enamored with Jesus that you wanted to be in his presence? These disciples show us some secrets here. They were walking on the road to Emmaus, but 2,000 years ago isn't just when it counts. This applies to us today. If you want to acquire that fire, if you want to have that holy heartburn, the first lesson for us is we have to listen as Jesus speaks through his spirit. This is so key. Notice this. The disciples revealed their hearts were on fire because he talked with us along the road. Who did the talking? Jesus did the talking. They had poured out their hearts. They were disappointed. They were complaining. They were whining. Jesus comes up and says, what are you talking about so earnestly? And then they zipped it and they listened. Oh, my goodness. Don't miss this. This is very, their hearts didn't burn when they talked to him. Their hearts burned when he talked to the, and this, is, this is the hidden gem, church. Don't miss this. So many people, and listen to the Lord. There are times when we just need to linger in his presence. It is such a beautiful thing and a powerful thing, but this is one of the hardest disciplines of the Christian walk. How are you doing with that? Think about this. Those who you know have practiced this spiritual discipline of getting still and being in it, they know this is a precious and a refreshing time with the Lord, and it changes everything. I think of Pat Lancaster, where you can tell when she has walked out of her prayer closet, and I guarantee you most of that time was not her filling up the Lord's ears. 
She was listening. She was kneeling at the feet of the master. Martha, Mary, y'all, just, just do the better thing. I have so much to tell you if you would just be still. Be still and know that I am your God. If we linger in his presence, y'all, you want heart that burns for him? That's the first lesson. That's where the deep waters are, church. It's not going through the rote and saying these same words over and over. This is deep stuff. And as we dig deeper, there's another lesson staring right there. If you want to acquire that fire, we must listen as Jesus speaks through the scriptures. But if we don't crack the book open, he's not going to have a chance to speak. These two disciples who had cold hearts, they were set on fire when Jesus talked with them and revealed the meaning of the scriptures. Let's be honest, y'all. This book can be a tough book. This book has some strange, funky things in it that are not easily discerned unless you have the Holy Spirit teaching. When a lost person reads the Bible, they can gain head knowledge, no doubt about it, but they cannot discern all all that God wants to say without the Spirit interpreting these things. There are some deep, this is a miracle book full of miracle power, and, and, and it, it is not casual reading for the lost to come by. There are miracle messages in this. As they journey together, Luke 24, 27 says, Jesus expounded to them all the scriptures. You know what that word expound means? It literally means like, I am going to translate a foreign language to you and open your heart. That is a powerful lesson. And he goes, and Jesus starts teaching them the scriptures from Moses all the way through the prophets, all the way through, starting with the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. He starts going through, and guess what he preaches? Jesus preaches Jesus. And they didn't even know it was him. How much more are we dependent on his spirit to open the eyes of our heart? They go through this, and he starts talking about, do you think they're on this road? It's dark. It's sunset. They're heading, and I know that that sunset just has to show them what's going on in their heart. They feel like the world is ending, and things are just all in disarray. And Jesus starts to talk about the Old Testament and how he was foreshadowed all throughout it. There's a shadow of the cross just three days ago, and it's all over the Old Testament. Now picture you are having this seminary class walking down the Emmaus Road with the Lord, and he's expounding these things, showing himself, showing that all the way back in Genesis, he was the ram at Abraham's altar. In Exodus, he was the spotless Passover lamb whose blood would be spilled to bring deliverance from death and freedom from slavery. He was the shepherd who David talked about in Psalm 23. Going forward, he was Isaiah's suffering servant in Isaiah 53 that we looked at last week. He was the fourth man in the fiery furnace with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Jesus was everywhere. No wonder their hearts burned on that road. Can you imagine being a part of that seminary class while walking seven miles? Wow. And their hearts burned within it. You could just see them pumping. There's something different about them. We don't know who he is yet, but there's something different. Something is burning about that. Now, check what happens next. This is so strange. I love this. Notice the disciples' response, because this is very revealing. They did it right. They had blown it up to this point. Notice that they didn't say, wow, he disappeared. He broke the bread. That was probably Jesus. Is it getting late? Should we go to the buffet? Should we get something to eat before it closes? It says they got up within the hour. They had just gotten there. They turned around and they went back. They didn't care why they had come. All they known was that the Lord is risen indeed. They were on fire. They went back up Mount Zion through the narrow alleys in the dark to find the other disciples to share the good news. He is risen. They let their glowing turn into going. That was how on fire their hearts were. Think about this. They let it change them. So church, I got to ask, I'm sorry. What about you? And what about me? When we read the scripture, does it change us? Or are we more interested in the distractions and the shiny trinkets with our free time? Do we binge certain shows on Netflix rather than turning into the word that will ignite our hearts? Do we fill it up with anything other than alone time with the Lord? Because that's the easy thing. But guess what? That's not the mark of a disciple. And that's what we're called to make and be is disciples. They showed up and they shouted out, it was, he is risen. And it wasn't a question mark. It wasn't like, he is risen? 
I'm Ron Burgundy? No, they said he is risen indeed. They knew it. And there's one other strange thing i got to point out in this passage. One of these two Emmaus disciples is named as Cleopas. The other one is left nameless. I wonder why that is. We're getting ready to get deep. Some people say this other disciple was Cleopas' wife. Possible. Others say, no, 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 this is Luke. It's his handwriting. It has all the hallmarks of an eyewitness. Surely this is Luke talking about this. But what if, what if this disciple is left unnamed so that 2,000 years later, a couple hundred people in Apex could look at this and insert ourselves into this picture and identify with what they went through? What if it was us who's had a rough week? What if it's us who got that email and you wished, oh, I never opened that? Or you got that phone call at 3 in the morning that that wreck was bad. It was worse than we thought. Or that diagnosis was not what you were expecting. Or that frayed relationship with your child just keeps severing and getting worse and worse. Maybe you are just like them and you're walking down that road and, and, and you, are, you have your hopes dashed just like them. And all of your dreams are crashing at your feet. And you're thinking, God, this is not the life I had imagined. <laughs> Can you identify with them? They felt every one of those. Their Lord, they had sold it all to follow him. And he, in their eyes, was possibly still lying in a cold, dark tomb. Can we put ourselves in there? If that describes you, then here is your challenge to change that. Stop. Pause in your busyness and listen to the Lord. Get alone with him. Let him speak through his spirit. Let him speak through his scripture. That's the lesson here. When we do that, we will slowly find our hearts burning again, perhaps once again, and they've grown cold. Jesus is still walking that road with us today. It's not just for the disciples. This is a living, breathing word. And if our hearts aren't burning, I'm sorry, maybe it's because we're not spending time with the master. And maybe you need us to hear that, that loving but firm challenge. We're not listening to him. Because here's the deal. He's still speaking. Jesus hasn't done this. He still speaks today the same way, through his spirit and through his scriptures. So let me ask two questions. Do you have a burning heart? Only you can answer that. And would you say you are today, in this moment, on fire? If not, you can be. This can be the day that you come and you rededicate. And you say, you know what, Lord? I am done being lukewarm. I am done playing patty cake with you. I am all in. People do that every week. In just a couple weeks, we're baptizing people of all ages. They're stepping forward and saying, I am all in. Maybe you need to do that. Maybe you need to get to that place where you rekindle that first love. I have a beautiful, beautiful picture in my mind. Have you ever been to a Renaissance fair or, or maybe the state fair and you're walking along and all of a sudden you come by a tent and something is different about this tent? You feel heat radiating off of it? And as you get closer, you think, there's something on fire in that thing. And then you peel back the flap and inside, sure enough, you see a master glasssmith at his furnace. And he's making things right there on the spot, beautiful creations for anyone who would stop and talk to him. And as he's sitting there sweating, using all kinds of different tools, you recognize the first one because he takes out this long pipe and he breathes air through it. And in this, he's able to expand it and make it grow and he could shape it and make something beautiful out of what is now on fire. And you recognize that. And as you stand, you start to see the sweat come down his brow. And you see, man, this guy is working hard. He is an expert. He is a master craftsman. And then he does something bizarre. He puts down the blowpipe, and he picks up the most bizarre, simple, benign-looking tool. He picks up something called the block, this half-bowl-shaped piece on a stick. But it's what the block does that is so remarkable. Not in the moment, but how its story. This is so cool. This block, from the moment it's made, 
is submerged completely in water. In fact, it's even shipped to the glassmith completely soaked in a container of water. But it gets worse. That thing never sees the light of day. It spends its entire life submerged in water, except woo, for the very few minutes that the master takes it and he sculpts something amazing. Anytime it's not being used, it is being submerged. Why? So that when it's called upon and it touches that burning molten glass, it's not consumed. It doesn't dry out. It doesn't crack. It doesn't catch fire. The wood must be continually saturated with water to protect it from burning up. During the times, it's being used for the master's glory. How about you? How about me? Jesus still wants our hearts burning. Just like this tool, if we want to be used by the master, we have to separate ourselves from the culture sometimes, to saturate ourselves at the master's feet, to let him speak where we listen through the scriptures, where we listen through his spirit. And when we do that, guess what? We won't be burned up in life and consumed. We won't be distracted by every shiny bangle that comes to take us off our course. No, we will live and look and behave like disciples. And it is powerful. And our hearts will burn to follow him. Let's pray about this. God, I thank you. You are here you are speaking. Lord, draw us closer to you. Forgive us for the times we allow our hearts to grow cold, where we get so distracted by trivial, banal things that don't matter at the end. Lord, help us to be disciples that are on fire for you, whose hearts burn for you. When people see us, may they see you and know we have been with you. We have been with the Master. Lord, I thank you for speaking through your Spirit. I thank you through speaking through your word today. Change us, Lord. We submit to you. We surrender to you, not in word, but in deed, in action, in full heart. We want to be all in. And that's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.